Okay, so the doors are closed, nobody can escape anymore. Very good. So, uh, first of all, let me thank you, uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about, uh, in my opinion, very interesting topic, uh, printable 3D models at CERN in the ALICE experiments. Uh, for all of those uh, which do not know what CERN is, I've made some introduction slides, so may maybe everybody raises their hand if, if he or she has never heard of CERN. Okay, let's make the counter tests. Who has heard from CERN? Okay, good. Fine, so it's very good because uh, the first 10 slides I can go through quite quickly, and which saves us a bit of time and we might be in schedule again. My presentation uh, itself is more or less organized in now that very short part about CERN. The Alice experiments and how we try to catch the people's interest in the things we are doing, in the science we are trying to do. And then some 3D models which merged out of these ideas which we had and some uh, explanation marks to them. So, CERN. Everybody knows this picture? Geneva Lake. Switzerland, somewhere around here, the Jura in, in France, French side here. We have a rather huge particle accelerator, which is called the Large Hadron Collider, and it's 27 kilometer in the circumference, and an average about 80 to 100 meter deep beneath the Earth. The main area is here, where all the offices and pre-accelerators are located, and the, since since everybody knows already about CERN and about the press, which it, uh, it was quite a lot in the media last year, due to specific reasons which I'm going to show you, but uh, it's quite amazing because in the tunnel itself you have a picture like that. You have little golf wagons where you can ride through these 27 kilometers. I forgot the number how fast a proton actually can go throughout the circumference. But uh, you can see if you're as equally fast with a bike. I guess probably not. Apart from that, if you have two beams uh, in opposite direction within this LHC, uh, you have four dedicated overlapping points, or four collision points. And at these four <coughs> collision points, you have the different experiments. The Atlas experiments and CMS experiments, which were quite a lot in the media. The Alice experiment, which I'm working on, I'm going to show you a few uh, a few more details about that, and there's the fourth one, the LHCB experiment. And a slide which is not allowed to be missed out if you have a presentation outside CERN, you always have to explain the mission of CERN. It's actually innovation, research, and quite a substantial part on education. Therefore, uniting people from all over the world. One of the main goals of the missions is to push back the frontiers of knowledge. Sounds nice, what does it mean? Well, at the moment we have a very trick part in uh, researching the Big Bang and what was directly after what, or what is matter and antimatter, like <coughs> where is all the antimatter gone? What, was, what are the building blocks of the universe and the first moments of its existence? Apart from that, which we always argue the, re the reason why we have this huge uh, experiments running, which are also quite expensive, is of course to answer these questions, but on the side hand to produce some spin-off products, always run on the very frontier of the modern technology. So in the course of answering that, these questions, we try to develop new technologies, new accelerators, new detectors, build them, Part of them, this knowledge of spin-off projects are well known, for example, the internet, which was created or invented at CERN from Tim Berners-Lee, and now we are working on the grids, and nowadays it became more famous uh, in, I think it's called cloud now, uh, commonly available, but the grid was worked on since, since 15 years at CERN. Then also medicine, diagnosis and therapy, and so on. A very substantial part is the frequent change of scientists at CERN. So we have quite a <coughs> lot of scientists and engineers trained at CERN. Currently, I think uh, we have 9,000 users <coughs> at CERN, which increased quite exponentially since we started the LHC. And the fourth thing, unite people from different countries. We have a summer student program, we have PhD programs, postdoc programs, and so on and so on. 
fundamental questions. I'm going to speed up a bit since there's not a lot of time. What is mass? Everybody knows Mr. Higgs postulated uh, the Higgs boson some time ago within the frame of the standard model. Another question is why is there more matter than antimatter? The LHCb by trying to look at the different decay times between antimatter particles and matter particles tries to measure this CP violation as it is called, which is one explanation. What happens within the first seconds after the Big Bang? This is the Alice experiment by trying to reproduce mini Big Bangs with lead-lead collisions, but I'm going explain a few more words later on. And one, what is the universe in general made of? We currently have this standard model. Unfortunately, it doesn't account for all the things we see in the universe. Let me jump back to the very first one. One of these pictures you've probably seen late June, Ju July last year, because one of the tasks of this LHC was to find the Higgs boson. Here you see a uh, four mu in decay, if I remember correctly, from a CMS experiment. There is have a distinctive signature which can be one of these Higgs bosons. If you count them all up, put them into histogram, subtract all the possible background from the other decay rates from the, from the normal decays from predicted by the standard model, then at some point you see that there is an additional pipe, uh, pipe peak. If you take out the Higgs from the standard model theory, you would not predict this peak. From the data, the little dots here, we actually see this peak and it coincides very well with the theory predictions. This up to five sigma gave us the idea that we basically went public and said, yes, we have found the Higgs boson. One of the first tasks of the LHC is actually done. But there are a few more tasks, like the very early universe, the so-called quark gluon plasma, which was a state of matter at the very early universe before the so-called hadronization, which was quite a while ago. I'm not going to count how many generations of humans that would have meant. And another thing, from the standard model, which we now understand quite well, which is proven to very high accuracy, now even includes the Higgs-like boson, we still have to say that, it only accounts about of 4% of the normal matter. Now there's still the big mystery about dark matter, dark energy, which we have not really grasped yet experimentally. In theory, there are some models you might know, supersymmetry, string theory even in some connection, but all those things have not been proven yet experimentally. And since the LHC is supposed to be a discovery machine, within the next 10 years of running, we are also trying to get a hint of this, for example, supersymmetric particles. Apart from all these very nice words and ideas, how do you actually try to study particle physics experimentally? Point, I just made five points, which makes it quite clear. You try to make collisions with particle beams to produce new particles, basically. You, try, you use the principle of Einstein. You take matter, make it to a very high density state, produce energy, and the energy freezes out again into matter into different particles. Look at the lots of collisions. Uh, at the current rates we have about 500 millions per second in terms of collisions. We have to build detectors to make a photograph, 3D photograph of all of them. So it's quite, quite dense. Measure those, count them, count the new ones, subtract those which you already know and then reconstruct the events and the collisions and compare them actually with <coughs> the ones you filtered out with the predictions of the theoretical models. So it's quite simple, is it? I'm maybe going to sk skip, well, um, why not? Here is a representation on one of a detector sector, a slice from the CMS experiment. And let me just tell you that we have different means of identifying particles. Uh, finding their origin, whether or not they were decayed particles, uh, which kind of particles they were, for example, electrons and photons, via different uh, magnetic and hadronic calorimeters identified, calculating their momentum, uh, their mass, and so on through, through different uh, dedicated de uh, detectors. And that's how the CMS for example, looks down the cavern. The cavern is really a cathedral-sized cave where this detector was built in. 
I could explain you a little bit more about which kind of detector you're seeing here, but uh, let me just tell you it's incredibly complicated and took more than 10 years to build it, even longer to design it. Here's the Atlas detector, the second one, CMS and Atlas, which actually found with, with the data from the last few years, the Higgs boson. The Alice experiment, which I am actually working on with the huge uh, L3 magnet and a few more details on that later on. And the LHCB, which is a single arm spectrometer looking at the different decay times of uh, beauty quarks, for example, to, to see why there is more matter than antimatter currently in the universe. Let me just directly jump to the Alice experiment, where people planning it since more than 15 years were very creative in finding an acronym which stands for Alice. It's A, Large Ion Collider Experiment. So it's very complicated if you use it in a paper and you say the Alice experiment, you actually use experiment twice, which makes it very tricky. Alice is, to just quote a general statement, a general purpose detector in contrast to the other experiments, uh, with focus on quantum chronodynamics and the quark gluon plasma, so the very early universe, very first million nanoseconds after the Big Bang, basically. And we are trying to probe this area by using not proton-proton collisions, but lead-lead collisions, so nucleus, quite, quite a lot of protons smashing into each other. And here you see a schematic representation of the different detectors, where I'm not going into details now, but let's just point out the inner tracking system, which is a silicon-based uh, tracker system, just measuring uh, the, the track along, along the which the particle went through, then there's a time projection chamber and then some outer par um, detectors, electromagnetic colorimeter, forward muon meter, in order to identify more and more and to cover a more complete space in the, in the four pi region. Now, how to catch people's interest? One idea would be to have very convincing arguments where this argument is actually about math because there's a very important difference between six and five bullets within such a caliber. So first of very good reason and convincing argument that you learn counting. But apart from that, you can also try to do videos, 3D animations like one of our event displays here from an upgraded uh, inner tracking system where the single little dots represent uh, collision points of the particles which came out of the collision and produced a signal within the detector. And then you have quite a lot of these signals which you have to reconstruct. So there's also quite interesting mathematics with Kalman filtering and so on included. Fancy looking pictures, of course, you can do beautiful, colorful, firework similar pictures like that. Or you show students screen, a computer screen, which you just do a screenshot and convince them that what is written on here, which you can't read unfortunately, is very, very interesting. Have I convinced you? I don't know. Let's try something else. There's also an, another method of producing videos like this one, explaining the different principles, in this case of the, inner tra of the time projection chamber, which is a huge beer can, not filled with beer, but with, with gas in the end. What you have is an electric field between the central electrode and the readout chambers, which, if a particle goes through, ionizes the gas, and the electrons produced are pushed towards these readout chambers. If you have a lot of collisions, this is really one of the best methods to, to detect these particles. Now it should actually turn around. No, it does not. Ah, yes, okay. And if you then look at the projection here on the x and y axis, you have a curvature due to the magnetic field, Lorentz force, and you also have how many free electrons you have along the way, which is a sign for the ionization potential and therefore in the beta block curve a, a sign for which particle type it was. But in addition with this beautiful detector, that's why it's called time projection chamber, you also have the projection time in set since you measure also the arrival time at this readout plate. So you have an instant, if you recalculate it, 500 megapixel 3D camera which takes up to 200 frames per second. 
which is not too bad. And also a very nice way to convince people that what we are doing at CERN is, is a very nice thing. But when I came back to my hometown of Graz, which is in the southeast of Austria, I looked at our little hill in the middle of the city and the clock tower. And when I walked up the stairs, which are, if I remember correctly, 387, I counted them two weeks ago, just out of interest, if you reached to the top, you have a very nice little model, a bronze model of the clock tower itself. And I was wondering, why, why is this thing there? And I was told by a friend of mine that it's actually for blind people, because they cannot really see the clock tower, but they can feel it and have a look and get explained on what all these uh, watchtower parts are, and so on, and were in previous times. Then, in the internet searching, I also found very different representation, probably also not 3D printed, but I'm pretty sure it tasted delicious, I guess so at least. So my idea was why can't we do something similar for, in general for high energy physics and that made me jump uh, through the internet first <laughs> having a few attempts on paper craft, you know these things probably, you can print a, a 2D object in this paper craft models, cut it, glue it and so on and create a quite quite nice and funny 3D model out of that. But it takes of course a lot of time and a lot of uh, very fine motorical skills probably. So the idea was what, what are we going to do with more complicated models? How to create them? Maybe, and then we, jump, uh, we stumbled over 3D printing. Maybe you can use rapid prototyping for that. Maybe not as complicated as this model here, but just step by step we started to look at our different sub detectors, like the already explained time projection chamber, where we have basically an outer cylinder, an inner cylinder, some field cages for the electric field within, then a central electrode to produce it, different readout sectors, 18 on each side, inner readout chambers, outer readout chambers, all those things you could then explain not only on on a picture itself, but on an actual model. This one was one of the first, which we printed. And it came back from Shapers, quite robust, I have to admit. So I was quite impressed by our first attempt. Maybe I can give it, I don't know, just put it through. I have a few more. But please give it back later on. So then, OK. Next step, why don't we use the, the li more little one, the, the inner tracking system, which is actually located here, just here. So in a completely different scale, I took one of those uh, pictures which we use all the time, where you see uh, different detector parts from the silicon tracker, <coughs> and we just built uh, a 3D model out of that as well, where you see the beam pipe, the silicon pixel detectors, silicon drift detectors, silicon strip detectors, the forward detectors, T0, and so on, and so on, and so on. Again, I just tried it, give it a go, and it came out quite beautiful, you have to admit. So if I, I just give it a round, if you're interested. Then, ah yeah, the others printed as well, <laughs> made a not very high quality photograph. But apart from that, next step would have been, let's think about particle tracks or the collision itself. <laughs> and from the event reconstruction, of course, we have all the necessary information from the sub detectors. From the event reconstruction, we do get all the information from a real collision, which we measured from the LHC at CERN. You have the particle origin. You have the particle dire direction in the 3D space. You have the particle type and, more importantly, the mass. The momentum itself through the curvature within the magnetic field and the particle charge, whether or not it's, it's uh, curved in this direction or in this direction, plus or minus. So, in principle, we have this information. So, why not use those, going, importing them with a little Python plugin, connecting our software to it, which was a bit tricky using Blender and then write a very simple parametric propagator just to follow up these curves. And here I have to put in a little bit of a disclaimer for all people who are familiar with high energy physics. Of course, we enlarged the particles. 
usually in a very small scale. If you print it, you have to have something printable. So we enlarged them, of course. We ignored multiple column scattering on the detector materials. We ignored here energy loss, which would make the helix smaller and smaller and smaller in time. Scaling the speed of light a little bit so that it looks a little bit better. But in principle, if you just write this little parametric propagator in cylindrical coordinates even, you can just read in single particles, have a look at the curvature, the direction, uh, what kind of particle it was, uh, scaling it to the speed of light, how far it would have gone after, let's say, one or two nanoseconds, for example. And then you have, uh, in addition, you make a bevel object around, make it solid, all those things. So I was quite surprised that it, that it worked with a little bit of headache over one or two weekends, but it worked quite, quite easily in the end. And this is what we've printed. So this is just the third step. Print it and also photographed in the original. And I was also pretty amazed by this one. So I'm going to throw it somewhere in this direction, but be careful, there are little spikes. <coughs> So we are quite happy with uh, the first test of, of this kind of technology. Unfortunately, I've already discussed it with some of your colleagues. I'm not sure if you are able to print these things with, with uh, FFF technology, with the filaments, but probably not. But apart from that, uh, let's, well, why not? Also, for the other people who don't have the model in their hand right now, here is the collision itself, where, for example, you just see one of these helix structures. One of these helix structures coming out from the center at a very small angle, or high eta, as we call it, pseudo rapidity. The helix form would continue in this direction. So it really looks nice. In principle, you could make them a little bit thicker for heavier mass particles a little bit thinner for, for electrons or something like that. But I, but I think in the end it's, it's a very nice test, let's put it like that. But apart from all these funny things which we intend to use later on in the exhibition, print uh, different detector models in the exhibition, put these models together, even let kids play for example, uh, in the, in, or use it in other outreach programs, I also, by talking to a friend of mine about two weeks ago, telling him about this workshop, he told me that uh, the polymers group, uh, polymers laboratory at CERN, actually also recently purchased a 3D printer, which I was quite amazed because I didn't know about it. If I would have known, I would have asked him to print something instead of paying money, very much money at Shapeways for those little things. But here you see different uh, detector, no, sorry, for the LHC upgrade, different designs, uh, different combination plates, uh, different interconnectors, holding cables and all those things, which can be very easily checked in terms of design, everything, was everything okay in the design itself? Uh, so they printed quite, quite a few of them. And here you see how they are glued together some parts, or how do they fit together, etc. Here, just being taken out of this powder printing technique. And also more, more interesting, uh, a rather complicated structure for the headspace of this uh, accelerator, where the magnets, which are needed in order to uh, give the particle a kick to go in a circular direction, it's quite a complicated structure of, of uh, magnets and so on, and you need spaces in between. And what they did is, for example, just uh, used the 3D representation of the spaces, printed them, um, impregnated them with the Sionate Easter Rising, if I pronounce that correctly. Also, in addition, put a glass fiber on top of it in order to obtain the desired mechanical properties which they need due to the very thin wall. And they're, they're currently just now testing all these things to see the, the capability of this 3D printing for an actual usage within the LHC upgrade. So this is also quite amazing. And this was already my last slide, I think. It was not as quick as, as hoped, but I'm also looking forward to a presentation 
tomorrow, I think, where large scale stone objects are printed in house size like things. And that's why I liked uh, this final picture here very, very well. At the end, made out of stone in the middle of the ocean. Thank you. Uh, yes. Well, yes, in the end we also have a time of flight detector which disti distinguishes between, for example, photons or low energetic electrons very well at a certain energy range, momentum range of course, up to, I don't remember now, but maybe 5, 6 GeV in our detector. So the, the, the length of the particle tracks itself was just uh, taking the normal curve, in introducing the mass of the particle, which we of course know with the origin, and then scaling it down a bit so that the difference appears a little bit bigger. Otherwise, uh, with the speed of light, most of the particles are above 800 MeV, or almost 1 GeV, so it's very hard to see the difference otherwise. It should be nice to compare with the heat uh, collision. Uh, Sorry, is it possible to compare with the heat collisions? Uh, with the Higgs collisions, yeah. you mean? Uh, in, in which sense? In terms of I mean, length? Yeah, or yeah, the experiment you did last year. No? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Higgs decays basically instantly. You would not see any of those. Just the following yeah, particles. The, the four lepton decays, of course, you could yeah. illustrate like the picture here. It was shown this easily, yes. Well, if you send us the file, we can try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, I would have to ask my colleagues because in the Alice experiment, the Higgs was officially not measured. <laughs> but I, I can try to, to send a few emails to ask my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Very much. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.